talk. And I'm really delighted that our guest speaker this year is art historian, Dr. Roshin Kendi. Dr. Kendi is a graduate of UCD and the University of Edinburgh and is an assistant professor in the UCD School of Arts History and Cultural Policy. Her research focuses on the critical reception of modern art in Ireland, the role and function of art writing post-1880, censorship, and on the position of women as artists and subjects in modern art. Today for us, Dr. Kendi is going to speak on the remarkable flaring of female credit uh, excuse me, female creativity <laughs> that was such a core feature of the Irish arts and crafts movement. That movement culminated roughly 100 years ago, and I think it's fair to say that it and its members are not as well known or as well remembered as they should be. To be honest, it is an area that was not very familiar to me. Um, so that's why I'm really looking forward to hearing today more about the movement and about the women who were involved. Eddie Brannigan, who is, is to blame or is responsible um, for organising today and in fact for liaising with um, all our missions uh, worldwide to set up our wonderful St. Bridges Day programme, um, is a real exponent of the arts and crafts movement. So I think it is very much thanks to him. Um, that you know we are all getting a glimpse into perhaps something that we aren't as familiar with. Um, I do believe though that others have jumped on the Eddie Bang bandwagon um, and this year, um, in fact next month, the National Gallery is going to host a new exhibition um, on the Tour Glynna Stained Glass Collective. Our own culture unit are going to this year also produce an exhibition on the Yates Sisters, the Kula Press and the Dune Emer Industries. So it really is very fitting that our Bridges Day talk today is, is, is on such an interesting topic. Um, just before I introduced Dr. Kendi, I would just point out the panels behind for those of you that can see them. These were commissioned last year by our embassies all over the world and people were asked to, I suppose, do a small quilt of what represented um, St. Bridges Day to them and there's a huge variety so I'd ask those of you here to have a look later and um, on your seats there's an actual explanation of each one so it's really really interesting and those online we might be able to to send around that um that presentation so you can you can have a look at what what came from across the world but as I say today is really about Dr. Kendi so I'm going to hand straight over now thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Fiona, and thank you, Eddie and uh, Eddie Brannigan and the Diaspora Unit here in the Department of Foreign Affairs for inviting me to speak about um, women of the Irish Arts and Crafts Movement, which is, I hope you will agree um, uh, by the end of this talk, a, a, a fascinating subject. And um, I'm, I'm sort of lucky you know, to be asked to speak about it because there are many other people, some of whom are here, who know a great deal more about this subject than I have than I do. Um, it's an area of growing research. There, as has been mentioned, there are a couple of number of important exhibitions coming up this year. There's a big research project on the Kula industries that Billy Shorthall is running in Trinity College along with Angela Griffith. So um, along with, with this information, um, you know, I'm, I'm building, or not, I shouldn't say even say I'm building, but I'm using a lot of research, um, giving you a sort of a summary of it, I suppose, in today's talk. Um, so if we can just begin the presentation, thanks. Okay, here we go. Um, so women artists played a central role in the Irish arts and crafts movement. They promoted experimental ways of making art and design through initiatives like on Tour Glynna, the Dunemer Industries, the Kula Industries, and through their individual production of carefully crafted objects and images. The arts and crafts movement coincided uh, in Ireland with the cultural revival which has been described as an intense phase of intellectual rejuvenation that created multiple forums in which intellectual exchange and artistic excellence were encouraged. And so, in other words, it was an incredibly creative and exciting period 
in the um, the history in Irish history and particularly in terms of the production of all different types of art and design. Uh, the arts and crafts movement itself, the broader uh, movement, originated as primarily a British design movement, although it, is, it became international, um, which promoted craftsmanship and the reform of industrial design. And it was inspired by the writings and ideas principally of John Ruskin and William Morris, who wanted to improve the standard of material goods and the lived environment, which they felt had been destroyed or was being destroyed by mass production, again, particularly in Britain. And they argued that the maker must understand the materials that they used and the production processes that they use. They must be involved in all of that. And I'm just, these two images, these are again, British, we'll move to Ireland rapidly. Um, a stuffy kind of Victorian drawing room, you know, you can't breathe in that space. It's full of, full of all kinds of objects made in all different types of uh, materials, different periods, different styles. And then on the other, we have um, what would be considered to be an arts and crafts interior. It's um, clean lines. It's um, open space. Um, if you look at the chair in the foreground of it, the, everything in it is uh, refers really to vernacular traditional design and traditional materials. And so the argument is that this, the second, if you like, the arts and crafts interior is a healthy space to live in physically and mentally, and it relates to the broader society. So it's not just about, um, you know, uh, interior decoration in that sense. It has much wider implications. Um, Ruskin and Morris were reacting against the demoralizing effects of machine production on craftsmen and women and workers, particularly through the Industrial Revolution, as I've said. Goods, they argued, should be handmade instead of by machine, and each would then transmit the individuality of the crafts worker to, you know, to the user of that object. They should be made of natural and local materials in traditional ways. And this type of production would, as I've sort of outlined, have a beneficial effect, first of all, on the quality of design in Britain. But more importantly, it would improve the moral fibre of its people, both those who made the goods and those who, who use them. And this image of a pen factory in the, from the London Illustrated News gives a sense of the dehumanisation process of, of, of uh, industrialization. You would make one tiny little part of that pen. You would have no sense really of the overall design and function of the object that you were making. Ruskin Stones of Venice, published in the early 1850s, set forth the hugely influential idea that the professional architect, painter and designer should be actively involved in the physical construction of objects, buildings and works of art. They shouldn't just make the drawings and designs and hand them over, if you like, to others to complete. They should understand, as I've said, the nature of the materials that they worked with, and they should collaborate with other crafts workers. William Morris believed that art should be an activity in which everyone participated. He was, he was even more radical than Ruskin and quite socialist in his beliefs. Um, uh, they, they should participate as makers and users. In other words, we all have the capacity to be designers and makers. We are all creative. Um, and it should include the whole range of everyday objects, not just luxury objects. His ultimate aim then was to improve society through design and education. And Ruskin visited Ireland um, several times in the late 19th century. According to Nicola Gordon Bow, in Ireland, the arts and crafts movement was as much concerned with political, social and cultural ideology as the making of beautiful, functional and materially fitted objects. So, I mean, Ireland is very different, obviously, from Britain. With the exception of the northeast of the country, we had no real industrial revolution to compare with Britain, and um, our problems, therefore, were very different. The famine and generations of subsistence living had largely eradicated knowledge and appreciation of vernacular and traditional crafts. Um, so the origins of the arts and crafts movement in Ireland lie in the philanthropic efforts of the gentry to encourage the development of domestic or cottage industry based on the use of traditional crafts and local materials um, to improve the standard of living for many ordinary Irish men and women. And as I've said already, it also coincided with the beginnings of the cultural revival, which really date roughly to about 1890, um, in which it played an active role of reawakening a sense of pride in Irish craft and materials. 
So the origins of the arts and crafts movement here in this country lie, as I've said, in the philanthropic efforts of the gentry, and especially two ladies, the Countess of Aberdeen and uh, Mrs. Hart. Um, their initiative laid the way for the foundation of the Arts and Crafts Society of Ireland in 1894, and they sought to encourage the development of domestic industry based on the use of traditional crafts and local materials. There was no political agenda, there was no nationalist agenda, really, um, behind these early projects. The aim of the two women, neither of them were Irish, was to provide a basic income for ordinary ruler, rural dwellers, especially women, and to stem mass emigration. Or I've also read, actually, in some cases, they say it was to facilitate emigration um, by making them, them skilled. They would have a skill to, to transfer abroad. Mrs. Hart was the wife of a well-known London surgeon who established the Donegal Industrial Fund in 1883, which aimed at reviving cottage industries, especially weaving and knitting. And it was centred uh, on Guidor. Specimens and tweeds and cloths were sent over from Scotland as models for the Irish craftsmen and women to use in their designs and their work. And Mrs. Hart also apparently produced dyes made from local Donegal plants and mosses and even soot. Following her success with this enterprise, she embarked on a nationwide scheme known as the Kells Embroidery, where dyed flax threads were used by crafts workers, mainly women, all over the country to embroider designs based on motifs in early Irish manuscripts on all kinds of furnishing fabrics. And there's a detail there of a curtain, detail of a, of a Kells Embroidery curtain gives you a sense of the elaborate nature of the embroidery and the, the sort of the Celtic um, look of it. This particular piece was exhibited in New York and reproduced in the, in the American press in that period. The Donegal Industrial Fund and the Kells Embroideries then, as, a, as I'm intimating, they, one of the major things that they did was they participated in major fairs and exhibitions all over Britain and in Paris and the United States. And these world's fairs or international exhibitions were extremely important at um, you know, projecting um, Irish industry and positive um, images of Irish life and history. Um, although for most of this, we would have been obviously part of the British Empire. I'm not going to go into details about that. That's a whole other lecture, as they say. Anyway, Mrs. Hart opened a shop in London um, for the Kells Embroidery, selling these goods in 1884. Um, in 1887, after an exhibition um, held by the fund in the London in Londonderry House um, in London, um, the Irish Times noted that the starving peasantry of the far west in the wild outlying regions of rugged Donegal possess instinctive skill and artistic taste that qualify them to produce the textile fabrics for which old Ireland was famous. So that might sound patronising, which it is in a way, but at the same time, it's um, a recognition, uh, you know, that there was skill and, if you like, hope in, in parts of the country that had been really sidelined in the previous decades. The Viceroyne Lady Aberdeen arrived in Dublin in 1886. She did a brief period as Lord and Lady Lieutenant, the Aberdeens at that time, and then they came back and were um, vice, uh, what would you call them, Lord Lieutenants, let's call them, between 19 and Lady Lieutenant, between 1905 and 1915. Lady Aberdeen inaugurated the Irish Industries Association in 1886, um, which brought together a, a lot of these cottage industries that had been developing in different parts of the country. So it sort of unified them um, and gave them, if you like, an identity and a, a sense of direction. And she launched the Irish Industries Association at a garden party in the Viceregal Lodge, which now, of course, would be Iris Nukderon, to which all guests had to array themselves in garments made of Irish materials. And she set that precedent and brought it back when she was um, uh, vice Reen or our lady lieutenant uh, in, the 80, in the 1910s. Um, she sponsored lace making cooperatives at Linan and at the Irish Lace Depot in Dublin. Um, lace making had been revived after the famine as a way again of stemming emigration and giving employment and skills to women all over the country. Lady Aberdeen, as I've said, wore Celtic style dresses um, for all really the kind of court occasions, um, uh, including when she was no longer, when she wasn't uh, connected directly with Ireland. And these were handmade and embroidered by Irish craftswomen. The, uh, the Irish Industrial uh, Industries Association also opened shops in Dublin and London, um, where between 1888 and 1914, they had sales amounting to £230,000 
which would have been a considerable amount of money in those days. And they collaborated with J.J. Fenwick um, in Bond Street in London in the 1890s, displaying Irish-made garments to fashionable London society. Lady Aberdeen and Mrs. Hart both organised rival Irish villages at the Chicago World's Fair in 1893. Lady Aberdeen's displayed the work of arts, the arts and crafts industries amidst reproductions, literally three dimensional architectural reproductions of the Blarney Castle, Muckras Abbey and Cormac's Chapel, and also held demonstrations of lace making, which were very popular. And Mrs. Hart established a Donegal Castle Irish village at the fair, which display the work um, in little kind of cottages made in um, you know, the textile enterprises that she was involved with in Ireland. Now, while such philanthropic endeavours were hierarchical and based on relying on an elite clientele, the only very elite could afford to buy the products of these, um, they provided a market for handcrafted products and all the profits were returned directly to the makers. So they, these were not, they were not interested in making money, if you like, for its own sake. Um, so their efforts overcame, as Hart termed it, the extraordinary isolation and removal from markets that was experienced you know, by those interested in handicrafts in, in rural Ireland. Um, so the arts and crafts movement. So in um, 1894, Lord Mayo founded the Arts and Crafts Society of Ireland. Um, Lord Mayo knew William Morris, was very influenced and interested in his ideas. And as I've said, Morris, Morris also was a very close friend of the Yates family and he visited Ireland on a number of occasions. The intention of the Cra Arts and Crafts Society was to develop much natural talent, which is now an unused or misdirected, according to Lord Mayo. It held its first exhibition in 1895, and at this and the next one in 1899, contemporary craft work was shown alongside loan exhibitions of 18th century Irish craft and samples of work from the English arts and crafts movement. So it took them a while to generate um, work from contemporary Irish crafts workers. By the third more selective exhibition in 1904, there began to be a sure sense of the consummate Irish arts and crafts movement. The society continued to hold exhibitions every few years until 1925, and it differed from the earlier philanthropic cottage industries in its validation of professional artists and craftspeople who were trained in specific media. So in other words, most of the people who um, exhibited with the Arts and Crafts Society had trained in art colleges in, um, in Ireland. Um, but there were important social mo motivations as well behind many of the enterprises, as we'll see associated with the arts and crafts movement. Commercially, our industrialized, industrially pr uh, produced goods were not permitted to be exhibited. Everything had to be handmade. Um, and the Arts and Crafts Society of Ireland promoted then a, 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 the use of local and good quality materials and good design. The work of many of these craft workers was also shown at the Oroctus exhibitions, which were inaugurated by the Gaelic League in 1904, and at international exhibitions such as the St. Louis World's Fair in 1904. Women were prominent as exhibitors and as members of its organising committees. In 1909, when the society reorganised along more professional lines and established the Guild of Irish Workers, two women, Evelyn Gleeson and Sophia St. John Whitty were on the council. And I should just say the Earl of Mayo was the president, I think throughout the whole um, period of the uh, organisation, but one of the vice presidents in 1909 anyway was Viscount Ivy of this parish, as it would say, um, uh, which I think, you know, he contributed a lot to the city. And that's an undercurrent that I hope to get back to at the end. But this idea of you actually give back to society is very significant. In 1921, Evelyn Gleeson succeeded Oswald Reeves as the Honorary Secretary of the Arts and Crafts Society of Ireland. I, I, I'm not really, just briefly in the middle there is Wilhelmina Geddes's cat design for the cover of the catalogue of one of the exhibitions. And really from about 1900, their catalogues become works of art in themselves and are designed by different members of the society. Um, and those are two very precious objects, both um, relating to enamelling, which was being taught, as we'll I'll move on to discuss, in the um, Dublin Metropolitan School of Art. So many of the women who participated in the um, Arts and Crafts Society exhibitions were recent graduates of the Dublin Metropolitan School of Art, or of regional colleges, most notably the Belfast School of Art and the Crawford School of Art in Cork. 
Part of the reason for the success of the movement generally were the reforms at these art schools and particularly the Dublin Metropolitan School of Art, which is now NCAD, which had been reorganised by T.P. Gill, Secretary of the Department of Agriculture and Technical Instruction after 1900. And the objectives of the school were now, um, after its reform, to establish a national school of art, encouraging freedom, aiming at distinctive national qualities, inspired by the beautiful and suggestive objects in the museum. So um, again, just to remind you, you can see over in the, the top right is a photograph really ostensibly of the National Library, but in tucked behind that to your right was um, the Dublin Metropolitan School of Art. So which was right in beside the National Library, newly, relatively newly opened National Library, the museum across the way and the RDS at that time. And then of course that became the Houses of Parliament of Leinster, the Dáil, in 1922. So it was actually very centrally lo lo located, but and more importantly, the students could and did go over to study the, the sort of precious Celtic, um, you know, um, what you call them, archaeological objects in um, the National Museum. They could even borrow them at various points in its history, but we won't go into that in a moment. So there was a large presence of women students in the Dublin Metropolitan School of Art, which was often commented on in a good way and a bad way at the time, depending on the viewpoint of the speaker. Female students had been admitted to what was then, it was then the um, Royal Dublin Society School of Design in 1849. It had subsequently become the Dublin Metropolitan School of Art. And they came to dominate the Metropolitan School of Art in the early years of the 20th century. Their previous exclusion from art academies had encouraged women to move into design and craft orientated work, participating particularly in this context in the new classes that were being set up in stained glass, enamelling and illustration, which were taught mainly by English arts and craft specialists brought over to develop these skills. So again, the Department of um, very good, the department names, the Department of Agriculture and Technical Instruction would have been very involved in that idea. So again, I'm making the argument here about politics, politicians, government, the whole fabric uh, supporting this initiative. The women students tended to come from middle class backgrounds where the acquisition of artistic skills had always been seen as part of the young woman's accomplishment. You know, it was good that you would go to art school, but you wouldn't be expected to pursue that in later life. Um, and their art artistic ambitions were not really taken seriously, certainly by some of the teachers and by their families. They wouldn't have been considered as important as some as the male members of the family who went on to study, so you know, medicine or um, law. Um, and many of them, as well, I should say, moved easily between art and design. There wasn't the same distinction between fine art and design, perhaps, that there is now. But they were both practical and idealistic in their outlook and in their uh, in the production of um, artworks and design works. The arts and crafts movement, as I've said, coincided with the Irish cultural revival, an era that marked a high point for the production of art in Ireland, particularly by women, and for the international recognition of the significance of the work of Irish artists and crafts workers. Roy Foster has noted how this exceptional generation rebelled against their elders, imagining a very different future for themselves and the generations to come. And some of the energy and dynamism of this group is captured in William Orpham's portraits of his students at the Dublin Metropolitan School of Art in the first decade of the 20th century. And um, here are portraits of Grace Gifford and Beatrice Elvery, who were both caught up in the idealism of that time, although both would endure severe hardships in the coming years and have very different political beliefs. They both contributed to the creative and imaginative projects of the revival. Gifford was a grandniece of Frederick William Burton, um, a very eminent 19th century painter, and he's actually director of the National Gallery in London. And she was a student at the Metropolitan School of Art and later, like Elvery, in the Slade School in London. She converted, she drove her family probably around the bend. She and I think her sister as well converted to Catholicism. They came from a respectable rat mines Protestant family. And she joined Sinn Féin um, and she was married to Joseph Mary Plunkett hours before his execution in Kilmainham Jail in 1916. Um, and just she produced, she was really a graphic artist. She produced um, cartoons and pamphlets and advertisements and so on um, uh, up until her death. I can't remember if she died, I think she died in the 1950s. Anyway, um, 
Elvery was um, they also came from you know relatively secure financial background. She was the daughter of um, a merchant family, the Elveries, who we all know from Elveries department stores um, or sports stores. I suppose they've become more recently. Um, they lived. They were based in Carrick Mines. Her aunt Phoebe Tracare was a very noted artist and designer in Edinburgh. She went to live in Edinburgh. She was a mother's sister. And she was um, uh, a leading me member of the Edinburgh Arts and Crafts uh, Society movement. Elvery herself, among other things, I mean, she was a great um, character and figure in Dublin. Um, she was a close friend of Sissy Beckett, Samuel's favourite auntie, who also attended the Dublin Metropolitan School of Art. And she travelled to Paris with Sissy um, uh, as part of, if you like, their education and adventures as young independent women in this period. Elvery was a student of sculpture in the Dublin Metropolitan School of Art, and one of her teachers was Oliver Shepherd, who used her as a model for Roisin Dove in his memorial to the young Ireland poet James Clarence Mangan, which is just right beside us here in St. Stephen's Green. It was erected in St. Stephen's Green by the National Literary Society of Ireland in 1909, again, part of the cultural revival. Her features personify the spirit of Ireland, referred to in Mangan's um, well-known poem, My Dark Rosaline. And such representations of Ireland, I think, indicate the, um, let's say, complex or maybe hypocritical attitude towards women in this era. They were often idealised as young and pure and personifications of something rather than individuals, while at the same time, many of them were struggling for, um, as I've said, sort of financial independence, for the right to vote, and some of them for national independence as well. Elvery's monumental painting of Era on the left here was prominently displayed in Patrick Pierce's school in St. Enda's, where it apparently inspired at least one student to go out and fight in the 1916 Rising, much to the horror, I should say, of Beatrice Elvery. It features an allegorical figure of Kathleen Houlihan with Young Ireland on her lap, and it was inspired by Maud Gaughan's performance in Lady Gregory and um, William Butler Yeats's play of that of the early 1900s, Kathleen E. Houlihan. The work is not an illustration of the play, but an expression of its central theme of a separate Irish nation and its past and future generations. Um, and it can be contrasted with a later post-independence image of Our Lady ironing, how she has come down from her pedestal, um, which was produced for the Kula Press by Beatrice, um, by Beatrice Elvery. Um, and you can see that she's she's used for the figure of Aera, really combines images of the Virgin Mary, that I, the idea of the cloak um, protecting the, the, the people of Ireland, if you like, under her cloak is taken. It's a, it's a well-known kind of a iconographic representation of the Virgin Mary from um, early Renaissance Italian art. And then in the background, we've got all the kind of the saints and so on lined up. Quite a terrifying painting unlike the other one, as I've said. I should say that Elvery made that Our Lady Ironing. She had three children, although she was very well off and I'm sure could afford a governess, and she sent herself in her different guises. Milligan described Ireland, Alice Milligan, who was involved in, in um, what was it, curating, if that's the right word, these, um, many of these um, tableau vivants. She described Ireland in one of these as, a, as her green robe flowing around her, the cap of liberty on her head, and in her hand, a shining sword. Such tableau, a hybrid of theatre and pictorial art, were silent, carefully costumed and designed. And these radical visualisations of Irish mythology and history provided a vital dynamic in reclaiming public space and in capturing the public imagination. They also provided powerful models of Irish womanhood for the female artists of the cultural revival and the arts and crafts movement. Cy Trench's poster for the Gaelic League, Shocked and Gaelica, in, of 1913 indicates the radicalization of some of these artists. It refers to the desire of the revival and an increasing facet of the arts and crafts movement to make Irish industry, agriculture and culture distinct from that of Britain and to enable Ireland to be self-financing and self-sustaining. This has come into its own since Brexit, I think, um, to my mind at least. Um, Trench uh, studied in Paris and she also studied in the Dublin Metropolitan School of Art just before the, the First World War. Um, she had joined the Gaelic League in London in 1908 and she changed her name. She changed, took a, an Irish, Irish version of her name. 
This was made when the Gaelic League was becoming more politically radical. And it contrasts, as we can see, two images of Ireland, both personified as a woman. On the left, the figure of Aerys stands proudly and independently in the dress of a Celtic warrior or queen, holding the ships that connect her to the outer world like reins of a chariot. The figure on the right, West Britain, is depicted as an aged beggar covered by a tattered union jack. The poster is typical of the ephemera and graphic design that proliferated during the revival in its use of Gaelic script, Celtic ornamentation and mythology, the sunrise motif at its centre, and in its female personification of Ireland. Women were now actively producing political imagery, and as we have seen, they chose strong assertive models for female personifications of Ireland instead of the submissive maidens of the mid-19th century. The use of these personified images of the nation enabled the citizen to identify with her glorious past as well as her uncertain future. For Protestant Anglo-Irish women, the use of a female figure facilitated an affinity with the Catholic population, this according to Belinda Loftus, through the long-established allegorical mother figure and its resonance with the iconography of the Virgin Mary. So in other words, it was a symbol that could be readily um, appreciated across religious and, and, and social divides. Arts and crafts workers and guilds produced embroidered gowns that now proclaimed a self-conscious and increasing desire for a separate Irish identity, which had a more political aspect than the versions being worn by Lady Aberdeen in the same period. In addition to their Celtic inspired decoration, the dresses were connected to the ra rational dress movement of the time, such as this one made by the Dunemer Guild. Here, according to Elaine Patterson, the sense of pride in Irish culture that was evident in the design and material of everyday objects at Dunemer is conjoined with a feminist concern for women's health, comfort and freedom of movement. The production of illustrations produced by craft workers of the arts and crafts movement, such as Elver again in this case, spread the message of the cultural revival much further than the previous uh, more precious objects that dominated their annual exhibitions. And here we see her doing work for Patrick Pierce again um, for his Ishgon of a to Ella and illustrations to Violet Russell's Heroes of the Dawn. Um, so, in 1903, an English stained glass artist and worker, Alfred E. Child, was brought over from London to start up a new course in stained glass at the Dublin um, Metropolitan School of Art. He was also made the manager of a new stained glass cooperative on Torglina, which was founded off Pembroke Street in Dublin by Sarah Purser, and Torglina meaning Tower of Glass. Purser, who was a very well established, very successful portrait painter, a very good businesswoman, took on graduates of the Dublin um, Metropolitan School of Art, mainly women to work in this studio. And she promoted the artistic and creative skills of individual crafts workers who produced different designs for each commission. So there wasn't a house style for Untorglina. Each um, worker designed the windows themselves. Many important female artists were to work there, including Wilhelmina Geddes and Evie Home. Um, and there's the formidable um, Sarah Purser in a drawing by John Butler Yeats. Then she's quite a figure. And there is an exhibition, I should say, coming up of her work in the Hugh Lane Gallery later this year, which I look forward to seeing very much. The first major enterprise in which Intorglina was involved was the decoration of St. Brendan's Cathedral in Loch Ray Cathedral. Um, it, it, the foundation stone of the cathedral was laid in 1897. In 1901, Sarah Purser was invited to be decorator in chief of the new building which she did for, um, from Antorglina. So she was actually got the job before she had set up on Antorglina. Um, and if, uh, I would advise any of you, if you haven't been to visit the cathedral, if you're traveling down that neck of the woods to, to go in and look at the, at the building. And there's a museum, a little museum as well. The clerics wanted to use, the clerics involved in Loch Ray wanted to use Irish craftsmen and women in its decoration and furnishing instead of importing stained glass and church furnishings from the continent, as was the general practice at the time. And St. Brendan's then became one of the most famous projects to counter the lack of serious religious art in Ireland. It was of enormous financial and reputational benefit to Antorglina. Um, the Catholic Church, they recognised, I mean, Purse was obviously Protestant and most of the women who worked in Antorglina were Church of Ireland, but they recognised that the Catholic Church was going to be a major source of patronage for art and design. So there was nothing sectarian really in any of these um, enterprises. One of the most distinctive parts of the decoration in the building then were the stained glass windows, which were all made in Antorglina over the course of several decades. They were, the last one wasn't put in until after the war in the 1940s. 
Thomas McGreevy, writing about the church in 1947, wrote that almost the whole history of the Tower of Glass or on Torglina can be traced there from the first shy but gallant effort in the true technique of stained glass by Sarah Purser herself, a sympathetic little St. Brendan panel in the porch, which you can see there, it's a little tiny, relatively compared to the other small window, down to the tenderly majestic St. Bridget, which was executed after Michael Healy's death by Miss Evie Home. Most stained glass windows in Ireland at that time and uh, continued uh, to, to some extent, were acquired from large international firms such as Franz Meyer of Munich or other uh, French or British firms. Um, Mu the Meyer of Munich was responsible for at least nine cathedrals, the windows in nine cathedrals of Ireland, um, Letterkenny, Waterford, Ballinath, Hurlis, Derry, Carlow and Cove. And although Catherine O'Brien, the other windows from a little church in, or church in Cork, by Catherine O'Brien, who was a, one of the, worked in Antour Glynna, was a member of Antour Glynna. Um, her, she's quite conservative in her approach, and this is quite conservative in design, but she has made several important references to Ireland in the Celtic interlacing patterns. You can see the background, the model of St. Cormac's Chapel, which St. Bridget is carrying. And this situates the window within a more local context than, for example, the Meyer window, which you, would, you could find that anywhere in Europe, you know, it doesn't say anything specific about Ireland. Um, whereas this Brit window, St. Bridget's window, could only really have been made within a kind of an Irish context. The oak leaves in the background as well are a symbol, of course, of Kildare, of Dara, of the oak, and the location where the saint established her church. Um, and really, um, Antorglina also supplied the Stations of the Cross, which were designed by Ethel Rind and made of mosaic. And um, again, the same point, one can contrast, if you like, the, the, the image on the left is the piece made by, uh, designed by Ethel Rind and made in Antour Glimma. You can contrast its flattened design with the Italian generic stations on the other side. This one comes, I think, from Letter Kenny. And these, of course, littered Irish churches in this period and, and do, still do to an extent. The tall warrior to the right with its spear in Ethel Rind's panel, I think, has a distinctively Celtic aspect. And what looked to me like megaliths behind the figures also evoke a sense of ancient Ireland. So that they're placing these important religious scenes within Irish contexts. So this is where, if you like, the arts and crafts movement appeals or it relates to a wider community rather than just the elite. And the sodality banners in St. Brendan's were embroidered in silk by the Dunemer Guild, another arts and crafts initiative, which I'll talk about now in a sec which was run by the eight sisters, Lillian Lolly and Evelyn Gleeson near Dundrum here in Dublin. Um, the um, banners were designed mainly by Jack Yates and his wife, Cotty Yates, and they were advised on the correct Irish names and also on the script by Father Deneen, who was working on a dictionary of Irish at the time. Jack and Cotty had to, again, like um, the other stained glass workers, had to discover, had to research and create new iconographies for these Irish saints. So St. Jarlath, St. Jarlath is down below on the left. He's wearing nice stockings and Celtic tunic. He's a patron saint of Tune and he's depicted apparently as an aristocrat because he has his own uh, carriage there. St. Colum Kill, who is on the upper uh, left, or upper right, I should say, is shown making a copy of Finian Psalter an act which led to his banishment in Iona, and he's using a portal dolman as his desk. The Irish Homestead, the journal edited by George Russell, praised the banners for their simplicity and naive feeling, and they are naive. They're, 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 there's an authentic uh, quality, which would have been ve very much um, a sort of venerated, if you like, um, in terms of the arts and crafts movement and the beginnings of kind of modern art as well. And there's nothing of a conventional style about them, each figure being true to the traditions of the time in which the saint lived, so that perhaps to the untutored eye, uh, Russell wrote, some of the figures might seem more quaint than beautiful in the ordinary sense. But one quickly realises that these saintly little medieval figures carry with them the real atmosphere and feeling of ancient Ireland, the Ireland of saints, and the ordinary style of church banner soon becomes commonplace and uninteresting by comparison. And just the St. Bridget again pops up. Um, this is made by um, Pamela Coleman Smith, an American artist who was involved in the arts and crafts movement and the Yates family. 
Evelyn Gleeson, who had studied art in London and had, and had close connections with the arts and crafts movement there, she was really the main founder of the Dunemer Industries in Dundrum in 1902. And she invited Lily and Lolly Yates, who were then living in London, to move to Dublin and to be part of this, um, to be part of Dunemer. She supplied the money and was in charge of the tapestry rugs and carpet section of the, the guild. They called the guild on Emer after Emer, wife of Cúhollán, who was a skilled weaver and embroiderer. And throughout its history, Dun Emer had an almost entirely female workforce and, and also on, um, on Twiglin, it was largely female, um, the mainly females worked for it as well. Um, on t Dun Emer was different, however. They recruited local girls to train and give less, they gave them lessons in cooking, sewing and Irish as well as, you know, teaching them how to embroider, print or whatever the specific craft was they were involved in. The enterprise was designed to create work then and economic independence for both the, um, the Yates's and Gleeson, but also for these younger women who, um, who came to work with them. In its 1903 perspectives, which I think was probably written by Gleeson, um, she writes, they, they I, I, these young workers, are taught to paint and their brains and fingers are made more active and understanding. Some of them, we hope, will become teachers to others so that similar industries may spread through the land. Um, Lily Yates, as you can see here, um, who was uh, the daughter of John Butler Yates and the sister of Jack and William, she had worked as an embroideress to Mae Morris, the, the daughter of William Morris in London in the 1880s and 90s, and she ran the embroidery section. And these are an example of two of the works that they produced, um, which you can see here, which I won't go, I'm constantly going on about time, but you can maybe ask, ask me details of them later. But they show, I will very briefly, they show kind of awareness of Japanese art and design, particularly the portiere, which would be literally something that you hung over a door to keep the drafts out. So that's the kind of thing they would have made, kind of uh, sort of practical but beautiful and expensive um, items for domestic context. But as we've seen, they were also involved in making vestments and things for religious context too. The um, Elizabeth Yates, um, or Lolly as she was known, Lily's sister, was in charge of the printing press. And she had worked at, um, at Kelmscott Press in London and was closely advised in the setting up of the press at Dunnemer by the English arts and crafts printer Emery Walker. In 1903, they began using um, this, a similar type of Albion press used by Walker and the arts and crafts movement in London. They printed poems and books by their brothers and contemporary poets and writers. And the paper they used was handmade of linen rags at Saggart Mills in Dublin. They used, as one would expect, Irish materials and worked on designs, they said, that were meant to reflect the spirit of the country. The first book they published was W.B. Yeats's In the Seven Woods. They published about 325 copies of this and it sold out rapidly. Um, Paul Larmer notes, for example, you can see um, the sort of generous margins and clear, crisp, clear print, a kind of a, almost a minimalist style. And they use this kind of red lettering in different parts for the title and to indicate emphasis. And that was used in this book. And then it became the standard for subsequent books that they published or printed. And they have a very kind of quaintly worded colophon at the end, which I can't read from here. Um, but it says, you know, how it was made in, um, in Dunemer and Dundrum and so on. And that makes, again, emphasizes this kind of the individuality and the preciousness, if you like, of the publication for the object. W.B. Yeats was the literary editor and his involvement has dominated or did dominate, let's say, for many decades, appraisal of the enterprise to the detriment of his sister, Lolly, who kept the business going through thick and thin and who was, as I've said, a skilled printer. Elizabeth had financially supported William and her parents in London in the 1890s. Um, and this has led some to argue that in some level, the uh, Dunemer and subsequently the Kula is, could be argued as a sort of a feminist um, enterprise. Again, that's a complex area, which questions later, as they say. So Lolly, she diversified not just publishing prints, she um, diversified into book plates, which were hugely successful. They designed um, the Jack and Cotty, his wife, designed many of these, um, and Lolly would have designed many of them. So it's hard to imagine book plates now in the, in the digital age, but there was a massive market for them in that period. Um, they were exhibited, um, they exhibited in all these fairs that I've described, um, and they were shown in New York at one point in the Book Lovers magazine in New York in 1908, 
praised in particular the work of the Dunemer for the book plate. They wrote a book plate should be should first of all be representative of the owner and symbolize him or her in a very definite way. It would be seen that the book plates which emanate from the Dunemer press have in the great majority have in the great majority of cases and wherever possible been designed or composed with that idea. And you get a sense of the diversification. These two book plates are probably both designed by Jack Yates. Um, one for his sister Lily, which shows the metal man there just uh, in the mouth of the Garavogue in Sligo, at Ross's point, and Josephine Webb, who's obviously an, av an avid reader, a reader not particularly of Irish books, if you look at the names of the writers there. She was an artist um, based in Dublin um, during the, this kind of period, the 1910s and 20s. Um, and they also issued coloured, hand-coloured prints, such as these two here, which the two of the first published, The Village and The Mountain Farm, by Jack B. Yates. And I'll really talk more about those, what those images mean um, when I'm talking more about his broadsides in a second, so you bear with me. So um, Gleason ran the weaving and carpet making part of the enterprise, and she was more politically aware, I think, and radical than the eight sisters. She was a former member of the Women's Suffrage Society, the Pioneer Club in England. And she'd studied design under Alexander Miller, a textile designer and follower of William Morris in London before um, moving to Ireland. And as I've said, it was she who raised the finances for Dunemer through Augustine uh, Henry, who was a botanist and a family friend. She got money from her brother, apparently, as well, and from an, uh, her inheritance um, or some sort of inheritance. And her widowed sister and three children also lived at Dunemer. So the house, they used the house as their home, as well as for these three different parts of the enterprise. Um, so her sister was widowed with three young children. Um, and so um, she, Gleason and the Yates sisters, they had to make money from this. They weren't being supported. Once the enterprise got going, they had to make money um, uh, from that, if you like. Um, and this is just, again, from the perspective, just to make the point again, they wrote, I wish to find work for Irish hands and the making of beautiful things was the beginning of Dunemer. Everything as far as possible is Irish, the paper of the books, the linen of the embroidery and the wool of the tapestry and carpets. The designs are also of the spirit and tradition of the country. And this is just uh, on, the, on the right, an example of one of their tapestries that they produced in this period. And here they are. And um, this is May Curley sitting at a display of the uh, Dunemer rugs and carpets. Um, again, they would have used the Arts and Crafts Society exhibitions um, and international exhibitions and shows in the United States and Britain and other parts um, to, um, to sell their work, but also, if you like, to um, publicise their work and attract attention, which they did. So in 1908, Lily and Lolly left the Dunemer Industries and set up the Cool Industries, so they split. The Dunemer Industries continued under a slightly different form under Gleeson, and Lily and Lolly moved into um, Church Town and set up the Kula Industries. They continued to produce um, embroideries uh, under Lily and books and um, prints under um, Elizabeth or Lolly. Um, in 1925, Elizabeth discarded Monsell's Emer, which had been the kind of press mark um, for, on the, again, the far side. It had been commissioned by um, WB Yates um, from Elizabeth, from Eleanor Monsell, sorry. Um, and um, Lolly wrote in 1932, she didn't really get on very well with WB most of the time, that the Lady Emer standing by the tree didn't have any meaning, except that our press was started as a woman's press. She's a very limp figure, is she not? Much as Kula makes me feel. So things didn't go completely uh, well for the, for the Yates sisters, I think, in the 1920s and 30s. It was replaced by the Lone Tree in the Landscape, um, a design of lollies, which was first used in Robin Flower's book, Love's Bittersweet, in 1925. So in the 1920s, we begin to see, um, in terms of the literature, a sort of almost a denigration, not of Kula so much, but of um, um, Elizabeth or Lolly Yates. Um, the Kula industries, and particularly their printing aspects, were revived by Lee Miller in 1969. And it's been said that he gave a kind of a negative perception of, of Lolly, you know, that it was WB Yeats who was really the genius behind the, um, the press. Um, now literature is completely reversing that, that notion. Um, one of the, uh, there's a brilliant essay by Simone Murray, an published in an Australian journal that discusses this, 
And she um, notes how James Joyce referred to Lily and Lolly as the weird sisters of Druid Drum in Ulysses. And I was probably having a go at, I would imagine, at WB Yeats in that, but a um, lot of the uh, literature on WB Yeats, including and his father by um, William Murphy, present um, Lolly as being, uh, you know, suffering from her nerves and all of this kind of thing, whereas she was really desperately trying to keep the business going under very difficult circumstances at, at, at times. One of the most successful ventures of Cooler was the Broadsides, and um, which began in um, 1907 under Don Emer, but continued with Cooler afterwards. And these were designed mainly by Jack Yates. In other words, the, the images are by Jack Yates and they, were, they included ballads and poems which were supplied to um, the Cooler uh, press by um, Jack Yates. Kula, just to say it was again a, a kind of an old name for um, kind of the area around South Dublin and North Wicklow. So instead of calling it Church Town Press, they called it Kula. Um, the form of the broad, uh, the broadsides imitated that of cheaply produced ballad sheets of the 19th century, but obviously much better quality which were sold at travelling fairs and markets all over the country, and many of which would have had a kind of a subversive quality. Jack, who collected these original ballads, um, he supplied, as I've said, the ballads and poems to be published in a broadside, which he wrote, or some, he wrote some himself, or he collected or requested some from friends such as John Maysfield, which you see in the first one here, um, the Campeche Irish. Um, so the, the contributors were not exclusively Irish, um, and Yeats alone provided the illustration. So he had to come up with two or three drawings a month for these, which, you know, was over a period of um, about seven or eight years. So it was quite, in a way, quite grueling for him. Um, and he, in fact, he often used old ones that he had in store. The 18th century font that they used for the, um, for the poems and the text, as Hilary Pyle has written, um, picks up what she says is the heroic approach of the traditional popular broadside. And I think these, um, this production played a crucial role in the Celtic revival in disseminating not just poetry, but images that evoked a distinctive and unique version of Irish identity. Strangely anachronistic, Jack's naive illustrations depicted tinkers, ballad singers, pirates and circus performers, as well as scenes from rural life and imagined historic events. They suggest a primitive, timeless world that belong more in the imagination than reality. And so they were published monthly over all these years in a limited edition of 300 copies, and all the illustrations were hand colored. It became a broadside, as I've said, one of the most significant productions of the Kula Press. Now, um, I know Billy Shortall is going to be ready to correct me on lots of this, and I'm very conscious about, but anyway, you can do that in private afterwards. Um, but I, there were relatively fewer subscribers to the Cooler Press in the 1920s and 30s. They seem to have gone through financial difficulties in that period, despite the rise in William Butler Yeats's reputation and his association with them. In the mid-1920s, it said, according to one of their biographers, they had to sell off their father's portraits of W.B. Yeats to help with the debt. And it said also that much of the financial loss came more from the embroidery than the printing side of the enterprise. In 1925, Jack withdrew from working for Cooler Press and he wrote to WB Yeats, who was helping with the dire financial situation, I can do no more. The last two or three drawings for prints I have given against my will, these productions are a drag to me and a loss to me and my reputation. And he did his last work for them really in February 1926. But he was at that point really trying, pushing on his career as an oil painter and also uh, he was writing to um, so uh, anyway, the treatment, I won't go into any, too many details about this, but um, there was a lot of bad feeling between William Butler Yeats and um, Elizabeth Lolly Yeats in the, in the 1930s. Um, Georgie Yeats, W.B. Yeats's wife, came in to help with a lot of the running of the of, of Cool at different times. And Anne Yeats recalls her parents, that's um, William Butler Yeats and Georgie Yeats, referring to Cool as that bloody nuisance. Now, having finished on, maybe on a, uh, I hope won't be on a, on a negative note, but that's, I mean, maybe that's a good example of how family history, particularly as it pertains to women, can sometimes um, be negative and uh, has, to be, has to be reinterpreted. Meanwhile, Gleason's Dunemer Industries flourished. 
In the later, uh, in later years, um, by, certainly by the 1920s, Gleeson was joined by her niece, Catherine McCormack, who was one of the, uh, her daughters, the daughters of her sister was brought up in the house beside the, where everything was happening. And she was supported by May Curley, who was a niece of Augustine Henry. In subsequent decades, um, after the split with the Yates sisters, Dunemer made embroidery for ecclesiastical use and developed a line in Celtic costumes for ladies' wear dress. Almost all the designs were provided by Gleeson. She did call on outside designers, again, usually women, such as Ethel Rind on occasion. And Dunemer made and designed carpets for the offices of the Canadian Pacific Railway, various items for the Honan Chapel, which was unveiled in UCC, in Cork in 1917 to uh, tremendous um, accolades. They made carpets for William Scott's designs for Monaghan Cathedral and a set of carpets for Copenhagen. And they moved their studio to Hardwick Street in, the du in Dublin city centre in 1912 and opened a shop selling cards and other Denima goods I, um, in Harcourt Street that ran for many years. And there is Evelyn Gleeson in her garden in Denima. So just to finish off, I'm nearly finished um, on the legacy of the, of the women of the arts and crafts movement. The art and design associated with the arts and crafts movement shaped the visual environment of post-independence Ireland, awakening as it had in many feelings of national pride and an abiding sense of the unique uh, nature of Irish identity. It provided a distinct visual and material culture that could be proclaimed through prestigious handmade objects and costumes. Many of its design elements were redirected into more ephemeral objects that were essential for the projection of the new state to its citizens and to the wider world. And I haven't included these here, but such as postage stamps and greeting cards. Um, and just, I'm not going to, because I can see I'm running out of time. Mia Cranwell, for example, was commissioned to make this casket here by Alice Stockford Green to house the scroll of the first Senate of the Irish Free State. And it was presented to the Senate in 1924. Inspired by the gallerous oratory, it's made of Norwegian copper overlaid with pierced and repoussé silver panels um, and panels of filigree, of si filigree silver and gold. And um, I won't go on about Cranwell's description, but one of the things that it's supposed to convey, she says, is the idea of giving art to the nation and the important role it is for leaders, for TDs, politicians, senators to understand the important role of art in the nation. The casket itself was shown in Manchester in 1924 and at the Glasgow Empire Exhibition in 1938, having been given to the Royal Irish Academy when the first Senate ceased to function in 1936. And it was allowed to get into a sort of a state of some disrepair and was um, restored apparently I've just read it on their website through the efforts of Nicola Gordon Bow, who um, I should mention at the beginning of this lecture is the great authority. Um, was the great authority on the arts and crafts movement. And I think the object encapsulates in material form the virtues and values that Cramwell and Stopford Green hoped that the new government would enforce and stand over. Um, Dunema continued to produce carpets for prestigious clients in the post-independence period. In 1923, it provided vestments for St. Patrick's Church in San Francisco, which were lavishly ornamented with panels of Celtic patterns designed by Catherine McCormack. In 1925, it completed a carpet for the Dole Chamber and also designed the one in the Senate Chamber. And these again were designed by Catherine McCormack. They use a more classical design which suits the Georgian architecture of Leinster House. In 1931, the Irish government presented a Dunemer carpet to post Pope Pius XII to mark the Eucharistic Congress, which was going to go on in Dublin the following year and which the pontiff placed in his private library in the Vatican. Don't know if it's still there. Um, this used the more simplified Celtic designs preferred by McCormack, inspired by trumpet pattern curves and spirals found on the Turo stone and Petrie's crown. When it was formally presented by Ambassador Bewley to the Pope, Bewley explained that the Celtic designs in the border relate the pattern back to Irish illuminated manuscripts. He declared that the Dunemer Guild had preserved the tradition of Irish design and culture, which had been forcibly interrupted in all branches by the English invasion. The Pope apparently presented medals and pictures and blessed the carpet weavers. Gleeson died in 1944 and McCormick gave up making carpets in the early 1950s, concentrating on embroidery and hand coloured cards. The Harcourt Street shop closed about 1964 and McCormick died in 1975. So the work produced by the women of the arts and crafts movement 
while neglected and marginalised for many decades in the mid 20th century, is now coming back into its own. Restored and placed in public buildings, such as the um, Wilhelmina Geddes' Children of the Year has been restored and is in display in the Ulster Museum. So we're crossing both divides here. Um, and Evie Holmes' Four Green Fields, which really neglected for many, many decades, was restored by the OPW and pushed, is now, as I'll show you, certainly back in government buildings and is on our TV screens quite regularly. It was made for the 1939 World's Fair in Antwerp, um, so restored and placed in public buildings are now the subject of many interesting projects and exhibitions. These works of art are a source of pride in the artistic achievements and social aspirations of their makers. Through nuanced, imaginative and beautifully crafted objects, these works continue to project important ideas on Irish mythology, symbolism, literature and identities. The enterprises that produced them, and they were all collaboratively made, established lasting high levels of design and craftsmanship that should be maintained and valued. And they have made and continue to make a positive contribution to the material and visual culture of the lives of all Ireland's citizens and its diaspora, not least its women. Thank you. Yeah, that was <laughs> didn't want to spoil spoil it by putting it on my face. Sweeten the pills sometimes. Put it that way. Thank you. Thank you, Roshin, for that fascinating talk. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any quick questions? I know some people are on a clock, but does anyone have any questions before? Um, well, they, they had a long-standing disagreement with Evelyn Gleeson. Actually, with Billy can answer this in more, much more great detail than I did. They, had, they, had, they never seemed to have got on very well from the get go. I don't really know if there's anything more than a personality, severe sort of personality clashes between them. But she was very generous to them. Um, uh, she allowed them, you know, to, I mean, Kula reissued many of the sort of uh, prints that had been made under the auspices of Dunemer and so on. And financially, I don't think they had to recompense her. Um, so, yeah, I think it's just a personality clash, really. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, yeah. Yes, I agree. I, I agree completely. And there, I mean, people like Person in particular, who's, who they didn't stay, they didn't leave Ireland after independence or anything like that. They just kept, they kept going, <laughs> kept working, kept producing things. And yes, I think they, there was a, a, a sense of, of giving back to society, really, that was very central, maybe central to their upbringing in some ways as well. But, uh, and also, as you say, uh, perhaps an Irish. Let's hope. That's a, an, uh, an aspect of, of Irish society too. Thank you for your patience.